This week, we go exploring with Steve Choate as he retells how he and a friend walked unsupported for 35 days, travelling 650 kilometres through the great sandy desert with five camels during 2018. Steve, the product of a family of adventures, shares how the adventure came about, the months of camel training, and the sheer logistics that went into even getting to the starting place. Once on the journey, Steve tells about the daily routine, the threat of rutting bull camels in the area, and the immensity of being in such an isolated part of the country. He also shares how this was as much a journey within as it was across a desert, and how he was overwhelmed by the kindness and generosity of others. This is a hugely engaging and enlightening conversation, and as Steve says, It's amazing just what we're capable of when we just give it a crack. So enjoy, Steve. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Exploration, big adventures and truly finding out what you're made of is what we're going to dive into today with my guest, Steve Cho. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good day. Good to be here, Bryn. Yes. Um, So one of the guests, well, one of the guests, one of the questions I always ask my guests right at the start um, is about their relationship with Western Australia. Yeah. You were... Born here, Subiaco. Correct. So tell me, what was it like growing up here? I had a really good childhood. I've I've had a, to be very honest, I've had a really good relationship with WA. Been really lucky. My grandparents came out from England, landed on a boat in Frio. So we started in Frio down the road. Yeah. Um, Parents grew up in Perth, both parents. um, And then, yeah, born in Subiaco and... Through, a oh, long story short, parents getting jobs in Manja. Grew up in Manja when it was a pretty pretty small place. A lot different to what it looks like now. Yeah. And, um, yeah, been really lucky. Seen a lot a lot of WA and um, had some pretty good adventures yeah. in it as well. But, um, yeah, very happy to be a local local boy. Well, um, are you a proud West Australian? Yeah, I am. I am. I think it's really easy to compare, and I think the conversation sometimes goes, um, I think it's so easy to bag on WA and to look at, you know, some of the cultural things that we might or might not have. And I think you you walk out your front door and you look at what we've got and you look at our beaches and you look at how much room and how you can use those things. You you can be on your own in a busy city, you know. And, um, yeah, I think there's a lot there if you look. There's tons. There is a lot. Yeah. So is this you? You can't see yourself living anywhere else? Or? I can. You can? I can. Yeah, I definitely can. So Where, where would that be? <laughs> well, oh, I'm, I'm open-minded about the future and I've got no... Uh, you know, I'm happy. I'm, I am happy where I am. My family's here. And, you know, nieces and nephews and parents and, and whatnot. But I, I've always got room in the mind for you know, wherever life may lead. So I think I'd always come back here if, yeah. if something if something happened, I think I'd always come back here. But for the foreseeable future with, with job and with, with career and whatnot, um, yeah, it, it's here for the foreseeable future. But yeah, never say never. Yeah. Yeah. So in your story, we have marathons down in the Antarctic in 2014. <laughs> and then we have, which is what we're going to dive into in a bit more in a minute, this 650k 32 day unsupported walk through the great sandy desert with camels Hmm. even as a job you're a firefighter there's a big focus and element of adventure and exploration in there where does that come from in steve's story i know i kind of try to think about that sometimes as well and it's got to be i think some of it's genetic like it's got to be, it's got to be, I, I, I grew up and, you know, I, I visited my grandparents in Leaderville, I remember as a kid and they had big photo albums They of, you know, in the 1960s going to China and Bali before it was developed and, you know, they'd leave dad at home during school years and just disappear, you know, they were big adventurers and um, obviously post-war and whatnot. And then growing up, I think adventure in our families really was really normalised. 
So mum mm. in her mum's a great athlete and sprinter and she'd always go overseas and compete, you know. Mm. That would be her thing and then but dad dad's I guess the real adventurer. He's obviously got it as well. He um like it would be normal for him well it was normal, I was fifteen, he'd come home and say, Steve, he wouldn't tell mum, he'd tell he'd tell me and then try to get it past <laughs> past mum. And he'd say, Oh, Steve, I'm gonna ride my pushy across Australia. I'm like, oh, okay. And you wouldn't blink. You'd just go, all right, no problem. What's for dinner? And he 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 did instill a real sense of adventure. Yeah. Not intentionally, I don't know, but yeah. just from just from watching the stuff just he did. Most. Yeah, yeah. So that was it. And then at the time growing up, that was very normal. And only from becoming an adult, thinking about you know what some of the stuff he did was pretty different. Mm. Um, you know, we're talking about a time where. There's no social media, nothing like that. He truly did all of those things, and he still would, still does, just for just for himself, you know. Yes, it was a real just self journey. So I think the normalisation of, I guess, abstract adventures and effort and things, mm. um, when these other ideas come up, they're not strange to yeah. me. They're not strange to our family. It's it's a it's almost expected. You know, and uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's where it comes from. Do you ever ask, do you ever speak to your old man about what goes on in these journeys? Why, what does it, where does he go? Yeah. In himself? Or? Yeah, probably not enough. You know, yeah. I, I went, when I went to the Antarctic, it was with him. Yes. That was his idea. I was meant to do, how it came about, I was meant to do Kokoda with him a few years earlier and two weeks before. We were going to leave. My appendix burst. I went to hospital for ten days. Long story. He ended up going. Yeah. Uh, it, was re- it was lucky in hindsight that I, I didn't go and it didn't burst over there. Yes. It went gangrenous and whatever. All of that. Yeah, that, that was fun. Good for future adventure. Not having a appendix. Yeah. By the well, way. Wrist so I just set the scene to go to these remote places. But um, yeah, I, I went. So I went to the Antarctic with him in 2014. Yeah. And. Um, he had some challenges down there with, with frostbite as well. Mm. Um, and subsequently he went back. But yeah, I, I've spent a, a bit of time, we, obviously down there with him, travelled with him after that. And just from the, the pure kilometres of driving I had to do recently with this desert trip, spent a lot of time with him. So yeah, pick, pick, I've picked his brains, but everything yeah. comes back to the same thing, which is it's, it's just for him. Yes. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think I really think we, I, I do think we think the same without acknowledging it. And it's just you're seeing what you're capable of. You're seeing what, actually, how you react under some pressure and some difficulty. I don't mind suffering a little bit. I, I, I think he doesn't either. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but there's an ethos there which is. Um, via osmosis again I guess but that is have a crack go and do it yeah you know um, obviously there's some confidence that underlies that that you, you know you're going to be able to do it yeah um, but really it's just yeah go go enjoy your life go and go and do it mm. Mm. awesome mm. so at a summary level give the listeners an overview of what you did last year Last year, okay, so last year it was kind of like the culmination of 12, 14 months prep work. Um, yeah. Took five camels. Uh, a friend, Anthony, and I took five camels that we trained from scratch. Uh, we'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, so we trained five camels, took them to the desert, took them to the Great Sandy Desert, 3,000 kilometers away from Perth, and um, walked them top to bottom through the Great Sandy Desert over 30, 34 days in the wild, um, supported for the first five days, unsupported for the rest, and got them to Kunawaraji, uh, which was the end of the trip for us. But that was, yeah, that's what happened last year. Right, so... How did that one come about? <laughs> <laughs> beer, friend. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, yeah, no, we having a couple of beers and um, we're both pretty. Yeah, yeah, and 
it was time to do something difficult again. Done, I did the Antarctic in 2014. That yeah. was my first marathon. That was a good... Um, that ticked a lot of boxes for me. You know, mm. there's a lot that <clears throat> happened down there that kind of, for me personally, mm. kicked me off in a direction of wanting to kind of explore a few more things, um, internal and external. And, uh, yeah, so the opportunity came up. Uh, so there was a link through uh, the guy I went with to this early explorer who had taken camels across WA and we thought, do you know, just, no. let's do that, yeah. We thought it'd be, we wanted to do something really hard and wanted to do it from scratch. And want, for me, I, I love taking, I, I love the idea of just having a thought and getting, turning that into action and actually getting to the point where, you, where you're doing just this arbitrary thing that you, you're sitting around thinking about and just showing that there is a link between um, these things that you think about and actually getting them done, you know, they yes. don't have to be, um, not every, you know, they don't have to be wild ideas that, you know, the next day you've forgotten about, you, you can go and do them. And if they don't exist, that's fine. You can, you can find a way to, to make these things happen. So that's, that's what it was about for me. It was about doing something really hard, having, creating an experience that you can't, you can't buy into that, mm. that it, it wasn't out there. And for good reason, by the, by yeah. the way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so finding out, having a crack. That was it. Yeah, beers and a, a little bit of inspiration. And you and Anthony had been, Anthony had been mates for some time? Yeah, 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 we'd been mates. Um, or probably as adults. Um, probably six, seven years earlier, had been on rock. He's a fantastic rock climber. Been on rock climbing trips with him to Thailand, and um, yeah, a good, a good character, stubborn enough to get through a, a, a trip <laughs> and a and a and a and an idea yeah. like that. So yeah, yeah, he was the right person to do it with for sure. So, I, I mean, I was going to ask, you come up with this idea, and then you're going to tell the people around you. Mm. Which is one of the first, I find, one of the first things you have to do with an idea is you've got to tell someone. Yeah. Right. And then, because then it comes a thing. Sure. Now, that can't have been difficult if you're talking to your dad or your mum. No. Given what you told me. Yeah. That's exactly how that conversation went down. <laughs> I was having coffee with him and I said, oh, I'm thinking about doing this. And mum went, oh, that'd be right. And dad's eyes just light up. Like, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So that was that. that Can was, I come too? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, only, only, yeah. only room for two. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, that was that was cool. Was it like telling other people out just outside of the family? You've got to be careful. I think there's so much this day and age where people want to go and do big things and they want to separate themselves from others and make a big deal about what they do. And this is mm. only my, my personal thoughts. And... Um, we were very much of the opinion we we just wanted we wanted to go out and get this thing done like it, it was for us and it was for mm. to see what we, we were capable of and I guess that's why you know this happened last year and I'm I'm talking to you now about it. it was never about you know let's do this and then you know leverage off it it was really let's go and experience something mm. tough and you know the 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 value is what we take away yes. from it. Um, saying that, I think. You know, it's, it's great having done it. It's great to be able to share it because it's you know it, it is something that was a bit different, and I've learned a lot. Yeah, and we'll find out in a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, so invariably, you you know, you've got your mates, and you let them know, and they they know you know they know me, and um, so it's a similar thing, kind of expected. But yeah. I guess, I guess it, yeah, it's not really about telling people. Um, they notice though when you when you're away every week up in the hills training camels and it yeah. becomes you know what was involved you know how much it took over everything um, you know then there's a bit more curiosity about okay what are you guys actually doing really, oh you're actually really. going to do this yeah, yeah yeah we we made that decision when we talked about it yeah every, when know, I said it I correct wasn't fucking about <laughs> that's right that's right so. Um, that's what, that's where the decision gets made. You're either doing it or you're not doing it. And I think, you know, that's the attitude you have to take into a lot of things. Yeah. And f for me, um, especially with something like that, that was, I know when something resonates with me, I know when there's something that 
I want to do. Um, and instantly I had that from mm. what we were talking about. So I knew, yep, that's, that's what's happening. Mm. So it's interesting what you said there just a minute ago about you felt it was time to do something. Mm. What does that feeling look like? Is it like a restlessness oh, or something? Oh, I'm, I'm in it right now in this chair. Like I've got it at the moment. It's like weather. It's kind of, oh, you juggle the responsibilities of life and you have to do that. You know, you've got to work a job. You've got to, well, yeah, unless you're lucky in another department, but you've got to work a job. You've got to, you know, you've got to maintain a relationship. You've got to, you know, you've got to have all these areas in your life. Yeah. And then you've got the thing that makes you tick. And if you don't do that, then you're a bit of a, well, for me, I've found I'm a bit of a hollow shell or I, I can function and get around all right, but yeah. I'm not as alive as I probably probably like to be, you know. But so what it feels like is your mind, it's like there's this part of your, of your mind that just starts cranking the gears and it doesn't know what it is, but it knows elements of it. Okay, and so this is what I'm in at the moment. I know that, okay, it's been a while since I got back from the desert and I was cooked when I came back, you know, and I'm, I'm good now and I've, you know, came back with some debt and I've paid that off and I've sorted out some few, a few things and I'm kind of just sitting there, just like, it's like surfing and sitting there waiting for a wave and then yeah. you kind of, you know, oh, that's, yeah, that's all right. That could be an option, not that one, not that one. And then you're like, yeah, it's that one. And what I've learned is not to force it not yes. to it's really easy there's this big thing say yes to everything don't say yes to everything no. like see what you really want to do and you'll know yeah. you'll know I've heard a lot of people say say no to a lot of things yeah you know there's there's a balance until you get this yeah there's yeah. a balance and it's hard to know what you want yeah. all I'll say is you'll know yeah. and so I've got some ideas going forward what that might be, but I don't know what it is. So, but yeah, I'll, I'll let you know as soon as I get it. But it, when when you get it, it's it's really clear. You know, that's it. Away you go. The other interesting thing was like you, you said earlier on was um, just wanting to do it for yourself because mm. so back in oh what was it two thousand and nine was in the UK. Mm-hmm. I chose to run a marathon, not in Antarctica. Mine was from Nice to Cannes yeah, and the all, French Riviera. They're all, they're all tough and nice. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. On a boat doesn't count. No, no, really. yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah. And they don't run themselves. Um, and look, I, I just chose to do it because it was just a thing and it was yep. a point and it was like, oh, I, I, I had this sort of a bit of restlessness. Yeah. I had a lot of people saying to me, because it seemed at the time that you wouldn't go and do something like that unless you were getting sponsored to do it, like sponsored for a charity yeah, okay. or this, that and the other, or, you know, people were jumping out of planes, oh, do it for charity and mm. this, that and the other. And people kept saying to me, oh, are you going to raise some money for a charity? Mm. And I couldn't get my head around it. Because mm. it was like, well, no, hang on a minute. I'm doing this for some very selfish reasons, right? Mm. It's all about me, right? I'm not doing this for anybody else. It is hugely selfish. Mm. And I've done other things before and I've done other things since. And, and, they're all for me, yeah. right? Completely for me. How does the link to raising money for charity, you know? So yeah. I like what you're saying about you did it for yourself and it's not necessarily, oh, because then I can write a book and go on a tour and I can talk about it. Because they're the and, questions you get. Yeah. You know, oh, are you going to do this and you do this and you just, well, no, no. Mm. Like it, 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 if something good happens out of it, great. But yeah. it's not what I'm chasing, what I'm chasing is turning up and being there that that's that's the win yeah the win's getting there whatever yeah. happens after that you've, you've got there you know? yeah getting to the start line Be- just the start being there that, yeah. that's it that's and it. then doing it yeah. yeah or whatever happens at least you went and did it yeah or at least you attempted to do it yeah you know you've you got some you, stories you die wondering <laughs> you know don't don't die wondering yeah find out hmm. so camel training camel tell training about, tell me about that from what I understand, like, that wasn't originally in the plan. You thought you'd just go and find some camels that you could use. Yeah, Is that right? Yeah, we, we thought. <laughs> we, we thought. We, we knew nothing. Is this why you're drinking the beer? This is why we're drinking the beer. So <laughs> where can we get these camels? We, we went through a lot of scenarios 
and you know, at one stage <laughs> we were going to fly a camelier over from South Australia because there's not many people out there, obviously involved in camels and serendipity kind of. Um, we're really lucky kicked in. Um, there was an ex station officer, an ex firefighter, um, who runs a camel farm in mm. Kalamunda. So we've kind of scoured the country looking for ways to piece this together, and and we first thought that we can rent we can rent camels. Surely you can rent camels, mm. or you can buy them, and you can. But they're expensive. They're really expensive. Train trekking can, camels. Just be, there's not many. Mm. There's a mob, mob over east that do it, and maybe a couple of other places. But we got connected to this guy called Chris O'Hora, in who became our guru um, in Kalamunda, just up in the hills. He's got a camel farm, and we met him, and he's crazy, and he's fantastic, <laughs> and we're like this is the line like, between crazy and genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's on it. And he, the methods he's got with his camels and what he can do. Anyway, so he, we went out there and we went, we met him, and he he was fantastic. He, I think he gets a lot of dreamers. You know, a lot of people come out there with similar ideas, and there's a romanticism to camels in the wild and all this. But yeah. he, um, he didn't buy into any of that. He said, right, you two, we're you're going to come out here. We're going to go for a ride, and you're going to see if you like it. So we did it. We went for for a ride. And he said, what do you think? Like, yep, we're in. We did a course with him. We got, he had some, he had some camels untrained that I think it, they were intended for a dairy that didn't happen or whatever the reason. He had some spare, mm. lack of a better term, spare camels. Spare camels like you do. And he thought, these, these hacks, this will be, these will be the ones for, for the boys. <laughs> the boys. And, uh. <laughs> It's like when you give you if you have a kid and you don't give them the best calf and when they get their pee place you you know they're going to do something wrong with it so have these ones fine. have these ones this one's got three legs Chris you'll be right <laughs> but we um, so we got these camels and we got two to start with and he was right one died um, in training it was really unfortunate actually because mm. um, through through no one's fault just you know ill health it wasn't while we were there um, training it was you know in between us going in and out but you know they're wild animals and chris's big thing is you know um you can you can be involved in these animals but the things with animals is they you know they can die that, that's you know wild wild stock can be dead stock it's just you know you can put in all this effort and two weeks before you want to go your strongest one that you've trained can can fall over so yeah they're, they're animals and yeah. anyway so we started training them we had two we'd get out there every week and you know, it became a real routine going to Kalamunda, coming back, you know, and you'd see the season change and like you'd brave it through winter and, you know, it was a beautiful place out there in the hills yeah. near, near, near the Bibbulmun. Yeah. Anyway, and we, we eventually got better at training these things and the only way to do it, because like I've never owned a dog, like I've got no background in animals. I've ridden a horse two or three times, yeah. you know, and... Anthony has a little bit of background with animals, but same thing, not not much. Yeah. And you're talking 500 kilo beasts, you know, that, yeah. that can kick in 360 degrees, that can fight. <laughs> and we, we, when you look at all the YouTube videos, I'm looking at camels, they're all, you know, tearing people's heads off. Like, they 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 defend themselves well, yeah. you know. <laughs> they're not pets. And so you, there's this barrier of overcoming, learning what to do, the right way to do it, and the, it, it was kind of learning for learning's sake. The only way to do it was to be there and doing it. So that's what, that's what we did. And so just trucking in the hours. That was it. And incremental gains and then adding things. And then you saw a change. You're like, okay, here's a step change. Something's happening. Um, we might be able to do this. And for a long time, we were just thinking there's no way. There's, like, we want to take these animals remotely they're a lifeboat. They're going to be the only thing that has all our stuff on it, and like we can't even get them to to cross a pen, like thirty meters. How are we going to walk them in a string as a group? You had to tie them up. There was so so much to do and so much to learn, and that became pretty much a journey for for Anthony and I. Like yeah. before taking off, it was like this is this is what no one sees, and this is what no one will see. Yeah. And it's not what it was about, but it became learning the process. Do you know what it was? It was learning. It was seeing in action, learning a skill from scratch. And in the back of the head, I was like, 
you know what, if you can, do you know what, if you can do it with a camel, whatever I want to do in the future, it's the same. If I can learn how to train this from scratch with no background, all right, the you know the blinkers are off in the future for other stuff I want to do because you've lost the excuse of not being able to do something. Yeah, you know you've got the, you know you can. Well, you know well, camel or no camel, you you learn how to do something that was difficult that requires skill, a level of expertise. And <laughs> experts not a word I associate with us and camels, yeah. but um, we're competent. You know, by the time we left, and we took five animals, fourteen months later, that were trained carrying our stuff, and yeah. we came home with five animals. So, you know, something worked. What were some of the stories you were telling yourself during the, the that training part? You know, the bits that are going on in your head. Oh yeah, just like what the hell, Jody, are you doing? And but you, you'd have it was funny. You'd you'd go out and you'd spend you'd get out there at six in the morning, seven in the morning. And you'd leave at five in the Arvo <coughs> every week and then that would, you know, ramp up as we got closer. But by closer, we chose a date that we had to go by. So we were committed to going. Mm. Um, we made a decision four months out, which was like a go, no go. And they were far from train and we were like, yep, yeah, we're doing it. So, because otherwise this thing will never happen. Yeah. So there was a real commitment in, um, in deciding to go. Um, but... Yeah, it was just, just you'd, you'd, you'd leave. Some days you'd leave and disheartened's not the right word, but you, you just couldn't see progress. Yeah. And so much of that progress was in the background. And then you'd have days where you... super tangible and visual up at the front. Not at all, but something was happening. And you'd have days where you would leave and on the drive home, like we'd look at each other and we'd just be like, yeah, this is going to happen. So something would change and... And it's interesting looking back now and thinking about it. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, pre-trip. And yeah. that was really what was happening. All those little things were doing something. And, um, you know, as much as we were maybe discouraged, the regularly enough, something would happen that seemed like it was going forward. Right. And it was only through doggedly just turning up and doing it. And if we if we we could have got six months into that training and easily just walked away, going, you know what, it's not going to happen because it didn't look like it was happening. Yeah, but somehow it did. You know, so uh, we just kept turning up. That's all. That's all. Keep we turning up. Keep turning up. Keep turning up. Keep doing it. So, why did you pick the date you did? Just because it was time to go, or it's annual leave, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of it's kind of true, yeah. No, it was when the moon was in this face. No, <laughs> I, I, I was just able to get some time off. Then. No, what we were looking for, we 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 studied the weather closely in the in the Great Sandy, and there's we were trying to. Oh, there's a bit of debate about it, but you, you can't go too early in the year because it is so hot, mm. and then you can't go too late because it's so wet as well so there's this there's this we were looking at all the grass and historical data and some of it was hard to find actually but we we kind of looked for where because it's remote because it's right no one's there very few people are there yeah there's two there's a couple of communities you know 60 70 people but that, that's it you yeah know, there's a reason people travel in four wheel drive cars down the canning stock route you know like there but and get through it in a few few days you know yeah there's there's nothing out there yeah and so we found the temperature that we had to take a gamble and we had to say, this is when we're going to go because we know the big heat wave drops off and this is our window and this is where we can get time off work. Um, balancing all those factors. And so that became, I think it was April 27, yeah, a year ago where we left and then hit the track late April, early May, like in the first couple of days in May, maybe, um, from Billy Luna. Nearly a year ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't feel like that. What and does it feel like? Yeah, it feels like I got back last week. <laughs> it's, it's like it's burnt in. Yes. And um, that's what monotony does when you have the same day, 34 <laughs> days in a row. It's easy to remember. But yeah, it was it, more weather. It was yeah. really the reason we went. We, th yeah. we thought, look, this is where it's okay. And it was a gamble and... and it kind of it, it paid off 
after the first week we there was a heat wave and we we got smashed yeah. in that first week you have to you have to truck out all the chemical ke- camels and yeah. all your gear mm-hmm. so just give us a run through what's all the gear you're carrying oh. all, all the camels going yeah so uh in the ethos of doing everything from scratch <laughs> we, <laughs> we had saddles made we learned how to up um I can say the word wrong up upholster um, so all the material attached to those saddles we were in in a shed sewing that um, Chris O'Hora the camel guru he helped us with the welding and the shape of the yep. saddles you know we were buying coconut husk to stuff padding to put these things matching them to the animals creating the the, the carry you know, the carry method on those saddles um, yeah but we, we had two vehicles to take them up north that took five days yeah, we'd never put them in a trailer for more than two hours previously. So there was some, like with that was the thing with that, with that date, that go date, we could have we could have waited, we could have trained for another year, and you know, but with the time we picked, everything just had to happen. So yeah, yeah the first first time we were transporting the five animals together was when we left. So there were a lot of things that happened for the first time on this trip. We were confident that they'd be okay, but there, there was definitely some unknowns. Yeah. Not everything was perfect, um, but we went and um, we, did, we did a lot of planning and logistically incredible how much had to come together. And Pulling well, a lot of friends and favours. Well, what's amazing is who comes out of the woodwork. That's, yes. That, was, that yes. was one of the coolest things. And like we... And I, I know we talk, you were talking before about the marathon you ran and people raising money. We ended up raising money and it was never our intention as what the trip was for, but it got to the point where there was so much interest in what we were doing. We thought, you know what? Of its own accord. People were saying, you know, what are you, you know, we want to help. And we're like, well, we don't, you know, we want to do this on our own. And they said, well, at least let us, you know, donate or whatever. So we, we raised, we end up picking a couple of charities yeah. and raising some money, but the people that came out of the woodwork were amazing. I'd go down to a coffee shop and there was a bloke there and, you know, I'm not about plugging people, but his <clears> name's <throat> Rob Golding and runs a painting company and just a mate of my brother-in-law who's a hockey player. And I've met him three or four times. Great bloke. I hadn't seen him in a year. Yeah. He walks out and through my brother-in-law, he goes, Jody, I've heard about this trip you're doing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, how can I help? I'm like, Rob, I'd like it. I don't expect you to help. He's like, what if I give you 500 bucks? I'm like, mate, it's like the, the people that yeah. you would never pick that, you know, and th- that's a relationship with someone one step removed, you know, but the best thing that one of the best things I got out of this trip was you saw mate, the, the, the nature of some people and who wants to help you. It's, it is phenomenal. It is phenomenal. So, um, yeah, we had that date. We left, and yeah, the rest is you know, all happened at. So we got to be the lunar. So, what was it like getting there, getting the gear out, gearing up, time to go? Tough. Like, we like packed the we, first. Yeah, so we were at the farm, and we, we're packing. Went out the night before, <clears> and we're packing this truck, and. We got up there and, you know, we broke up the trip. It's 3,000 kilometres that mm-hmm. you've got. And, and the ca- it takes its toll on the animal. So every night you have to stop, get them out, walk them around, feed them. You know, we had a sick camel. And like, if you've ever seen a camel vomit, it's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think it was just a bit of motion sickness or something. Um, well, it must have been the first or second day. And so hey, she was fine in the end of it. You know, we gave her food and fluids and, and whatnot. But... It, it it is a challenge itself transporting five animals three thousand kilometers yeah. and we took them down we got to Halls Creek on day four and day four day five and we still had to get to our start line which is Billy Luna which is this community 178 kilometers down the Tanami I knew nothing about what uh, these roads but the Tanami which is up near Wolf Creek it's a corrugated road like this right and if you've ever driven a trailer with animals or like any weight on corrugation just six and a half hours later like you're going 20 you know 15 20 kilometers an hour just no it we got there got to the start line the more amazing part is my dad drove a car a mate 
just drove the other car, we're at the start line, they're turning around doing a Yui to drive back to Perth, you know, yeah. and we found out at the end of the trip that the trailers we took just disintegrated on the way back. Like, <laughs> there, one was left in broom in a welding shop. Like there was no shortage of stuff like that happened. Like, <coughs> and there was, and then we'll talk about it later. But coming out the other end, you know, was a mission. Uh, like post trip, it was just so. Yeah, you got there, you've unloaded all this gear. Every day became handling. So each each animal is carrying 170 kilos. Mm. You know, and you're taking that on and off twice a day. You know, you're moving a lot of weight mm. and just the sheer effort in setting up for the day before you even take a step in the right direction. Was, how long did that take? I can tell you how long that took. Yeah, we, <laughs> cool. we got it down to the minute, you know. Like, so we had five animals. We had to saddle, but take a step back. You wake up, it's four o'clock. I was going to ask, what does a typical... I'll tell you a typical day. <laughs> <laughs> so alarm goes off at four. I think yeah. we pushed it out to 4.30 in the end and we experimented with three o'clock a couple of times but we fell into this rhythm so went off at four or four thirty as soon it's still dark it's still black and it yeah. is dark out there oh, yeah, and yeah. you're in some valleys and it's pretty cold and you've got your beanie on anyway first thing i have this air mattress this thin air mattress is best investment for the whole trip so yeah whatever it was and the first thing i would do because i was so tired i, I just pull the tab so that it starts deflating because you know that you're uncomfortable and you're not going to go back to sleep. So, alarm and go so off. I just pull. You're really managing pull, yourself. Pull the ripcord, and you just, you just, you didn't even allow the thought of what you had to do that day come into your mind because there's so much to do. You just, you just went through the motions. So you got up, you'd roll up your tent, you'd get dressed, pack up your tent, put it all in a bag, put that in a bag. You get the trans you're on because you needed to start boiling water for brekkie. We'd go and get one camel, unhobble it, get it off a line create a clearing sometimes you have to clear spinifex get yeah. that on the ground dust it off brush it off because what is it hobbling me oh so at night you have to hobble the camels yeah so it's like putting handcuffs on their on their oh, on their yes. feet yes because we had them all on a line and that was hard you had to find two points you could put a put a length of rope between yeah and sometimes you didn't have that but you needed it so yeah anyway another one of the five thousand problems of the desert we had a joke that the desert always won. Uh, you could never get one up. You had to pay your dues. That's yeah. how I look at it now. And um, so you'd unhobble the camel and you'd take it off the line. This is one. You've got four other ones on the line. Walk it over. Get it on the ground. Um, you need to tie its front leg so that it couldn't get up while you're saddling it. Um, it's pitch black. You're working off a little headlight. You know? Yeah. And uh, it's, you're in the middle of the desert, and it's nice and quiet. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. and so you'd brush the animal down, put blankets on it, see if there's any wear patches. Get the sa- pick up the saddle, put the saddle on, make sure it's the right saddle. Put the water on it, make sure it's balanced. Put the other elements on it, tie it off, tie that on. Now to get that saddle on, you pretty much had to dig under the camel to to get the belt through underneath the, the belly of the animal. Mm. You, you've got to put the tail cropper on. There's a lot of work, if that's for one one animal. Mm. Untie it, stand it up, make sure things are balanced. If not, get it back down, fine-tune, because anything that's out of balance, they're wearing, they're wearing that saddle and all that weight for the next six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours. So it has to be right. Yeah. Otherwise, it's like having a stone in your shoe or something yeah. like that. And, you know... So we'd get that right. We'd take that animal back to the line, get another one. Water's still boiling over at brekkie. We'd do another camel. We'd try to get two camels done before breakfast because it was so drawn out. Anyway, same method for that. Put that animal back, have brekkie. Nothing fancy, by the way. Mm. Um, And went back to the other three camels, pack up that line, put them in a string, check, pack up all the cooking gear that you had, Everything, don't leave a trace. By the time you've got your clothes, everything backpack on, turn on your Garmin. That would take anywhere from two hours 30 to three hours. So oh. it's seven o'clock now, 7.30. I think we got we had a dream run one, one morning where we balanced it, everything was perfect. And I think we did it in two hours, 19 or something. And that was like, that was a big deal. <laughs> so that was how your day started yeah and then and then you've got your work to do yeah then you're off walking 
and the way things worked out, we'd aim for... Our intention was to ride the animals, but when we got to the desert, we, there, we found out there were three wells that we were relying on because we were going to pull water out of wells mm. um, from, from the, where we were going. And we found out very early that one of those wells was rancid, that the lid was off, there were animals in it and unusable. So we were down to two wells mm. really early in the trip that we knew about for that, that distance. You How know, did you find that out? Just through, so we're on the canning stock route and very near to the canning stock route. And we so people would travel on their four-wheel drive on that. And we came across some people early on the trip. We didn't see that many cars, actually. We thought mm. we'd see a lot more. And they told us. Um, so we found out very early there was no water, useful water that we were relying on. So what it meant was instead of us having the ability to ride that animal, we needed to replace our weight with extra water right. from those sources we knew yeah. were there. So it became a walk instead of a walk ride. <laughs> so, But you just, you know, cop it on the chin and, and deal with it. That's what we're dealing with. We'll, we'll do it. And then you're so walking for what? 20, 24 kilometres is what we would aim for. And that Which was... take you... Uh, by one o'clock, we'd start looking. Our aim was to get to 20K and then start looking for a campsite. Because remember I said you needed two points to tie the rope between. Yeah. You'd be looking for a tree or a stump and, and a lot of the times you couldn't find it. We'd walk through burnt out sections that lasted for three days, you yeah. know, which is tough because the animals aren't eating because yeah. they're relying on the scrub in the desert. We're not carrying food for them. Yeah. Um, amazing animals, they can eat 80% of what they find. But yes. when it's burnt out, like you black can't. stumps for, for four days, Sorry, you know, sorry, guys. <laughs> but uh, so we'd walk 20K and then as soon as we could find something, there was a campsite, inverted commas, um, that would be it for the day. So it, was, it became a bit of a, a gamble. We call it dune gambling. So the, the, the dunes were huge. They'd start at six metres, but by the middle of the desert, they're 16 metres high. Right. And, and, and 20K doesn't sound like much, but when it's, it's that's like 20 kilometres on the beach, in full heat, in full mm. exposure. And it's hard to translate because I think 20K, no problem. But I'm also sitting in a room. I'm under a roof. I'm rested. I'm comfortable. I don't have five animals. And they get... you know, They're not walking with you. They are for the first couple of hours. And you think... And you, and you make some pretty good ground. But three hours in, and they're starting to pull a little bit, you know. And as they're getting tired, it's a real fight to get them, especially up dunes and over hills. So yeah. it's a really, really slow going. But um, we, we know we needed to do at least 20K, and we'd find our spot, put them down, and uh, and then there's all the work to do at night, Yeah, you know, so it doesn't stop. you got another three hours to take it. To taking things off. doesn't take three hours to get them off. Yeah. It took, takes an hour to get it off. Yeah. But then you've got to set up your lines. You've got to dig out spin effects. You know, you're off the track. You, you have to graze them. You have to give them food. So you've got to walk them around. Yeah. So you have your lunch at two o'clock. Nothing special. Once yeah. again. What did you generally eat? Like the food was... We were, I, I joke about that. We got really yeah. lucky. We got... Same people came out of the woodwork. We ended up getting invited over to Monash University in Melbourne. Right. Melbourne. Sydney, Melbourne. Melbourne. And there, there's this amazing guy. He's the, he's the head uh, senior lecturer. I think he's a professor. Ricardo da Costa. That's his name. And he created this food. It's a dehydrated food that he would give to ultra-endurance athletes. Yeah. And they heard of, he heard about our trip through a mutual friend <coughs> I've got over here, mm. a great dietitian. And he said, look, if you guys can fly over, we'll test you, we'll see what your bodies do, we'll put you under the circumstances that you're going to be in, relatively. You know, uh, so we ended up in his lab, did all the VO2 testing, did respiratory based metabolic resting yeah. testing, and then he worked out how many kilojoules we would need each based on what we're doing. But what he really wanted to find out, and this, the, so, you know, two weeks later, we got 80, 90 kilos of packet food turn up from Monash from Ricardo it was amazing yeah and it was all there were four different types of meals just for variety but what he he was looking at was 
this thing called flavour fatigue and what happens. So people had consumed it for maybe a week or two weeks, but had never seen 30 plus days. And, yeah. and what happens to taste and how you start reacting to that taste. Mm. So it was a bit of an experiment for them and it meant that we had the right food for our trip. So um, you're really lucky. It actually tasted, it was chef prepared. It actually tasted really good. Mm. Um, but And all we would have to do is add hot water, stir and wait. So everything became about low energy expenditure of doing a task and so anything that could help with that for us mm. um, really made a difference like mm. you really prioritize where your energy went and um, but yeah that's what we that's what we lived off plus mm. a little bit extra so I, what else do, oh there wasn't much but it's just some like milo and milk powders and stuff like that to and you know to cover the spectrum very loose spectrum of yes. your basic needs. So, what were some of the real key challenges that started to turn up? I mean, obviously, you're yeah. talking about you giving me the idea of the typical day and the typical challenges of executing the typical day. Mm. You know, I watched a little video with bull camels that yeah. looked interesting. Yeah, yeah, we had like, so we took five female camels. Yeah, did they have what? names? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got to try it. Not one, two, three, and four. Yeah, oh, we should have called them that. No, no, it gone way more. But one was, yeah, so we had, I better be able to remember them all. They, they took our, they lugged our gear for us. We had Buddha, Mrs. Brown, Couscous, Haroon, and Falcor. That were the five. And we came home with them all. So that was, that was the best thing. But five female camels. What we found out is there's a huge wild population of feral camels in the desert. There's meant to be up to a million across right. Australia and a couple hundred thousand in the desert. So that's all good. The only problem is the male bull camels go into rut. So the females don't go into heat. The male bulls go into rut. Right. So what that means is, you know, they're just super horny. Tongues hanging out, salivas, and they'll they'll charge in. They they want the female camels, yeah, which is what they normally get. But they're not normally tied up in a string, and there's not normally a couple of blokes on the front of it, you know, walking <laughs> them through a desert. So there's a lot of history with people being attacked near the female camel. So <coughs> that was a real risk. And we look, we thought, you know, we were prepared for all eventualities, and we thought we might see a few. You know, we might see a few. We, we had 12, 13 altercations with them in the end. Seven pretty serious, uh, pretty uncomfortable. Um, and meaning? Oh, meaning they're charging in at you. Um, they're 900 kilos. We're wo working up at 2 a.m. in the morning with them going for our female, female camels. Um, yeah, the closest one got to us was probably about 15 meters. I got stalked by one um, one evening. It was really unlucky, actually. Um, we just had a really long day, and we had to pull up. We found some tree. Found a tree, and we found out later that it must have been a, a, like a spot for where a big bull camel lives, because there was a few marks around. We found the next day, but um, Anthony had gone off one way with two camels, and I'd gone another way with three camels, and. I turned around because it's actually quite relaxing by the time you're grazing them. It's in the evening yeah, yeah. And, and this animal, this big bull must have come back up the hill on, on sunset. And I turned around and I saw a, a, a huge bull and I didn't really give it much thought. And then you click and you realize, hang on, that's not one of ours. And it just started coming in at me. And um, At pace? No, not quickly initially. Um, and I thought, which was unusual because the other ones had... And I thought, okay, all right, I'm just going to... I couldn't see Anthony. I knew he was over a ridge. And I thought, I'll, I'll walk in the direction towards him, start yelling out his name, because he's got a rifle. And right. I don't. And, which, and it's one of the few times that we weren't kind of near each other yeah. grazing. So I thought... First thing I thought was, you know, no sharp actions, like just nice and smooth, keep walking. So I just kept walking, kept them moving, kind of tried to maintain that gap. And I was trying to yell for Anthony because we didn't have any other contact at that stage. He was down in a ridge, um, must have found something green for the other camels to eat, you know, because it was hard to find like, yeah. available food. You know, it probably took about two minutes and that doesn't sound like long, but it's quite a long time when you've got that big animal behind you. Yeah. And, um, 
Yeah, so anyway, we, we sorted him out. And um, that evening we had another two come up. So it's just a really unlucky, unlucky spot. Um, but yeah, pretty, um, it's a pretty weird feeling because um, we'd seen a few at that stage and we'd had some incidents with them. But you'd always be prepared and ready for it. It was the one time in that trip where, you know, I felt like there, there, there just was something missing, you know, like a defensive element missing from that. Yeah. You're really a little bit vulnerable with them. And, but once you just work it out. You know, it's um. You don't want to leave the animals either. You know, yeah. like I, I was never going to let go of them. I'll, you know, figure we'll, we'll work this out. So, um, yeah, that that was a big night. They, yeah, that, but they're monsters. They really are. I think they they cull them through that region. They cull hundreds of thousands of them, and um, so that was one of the risks. Yeah, but we thought we'd see a couple, but. Yeah, it didn't Somebody's didn't bank on on that many, mm. and it was a bit unfortunate. They're amazing animals, you know, and we'd work so closely with ours, and you know, we we really our intention is not to go out there and kill any animals, but um, you know, it was a real defensive survival thing we were doing out there, and it's different talking about it when you're in a um, you know, in the comfort of a city, but it's a really different situation mm. when you're in the middle of a desert. We work because uh, you're probably on your own. We are on our own. Like we, it like, is one of the most remote locations people you can do find. not seldom end up in a place where they are so so remote. I remember mm. the folly of youth. I went to South America in nineteen ninety eight. Yeah, and my dad came with me. Dad, dad came over for a week. I was there for four months. My old man came over for ten days. Yep, yeah. and we took we went with this Kiwi guy, and we went up to his. Um, went out to this mountain village and then we went with this Kiwi guy and we went on his donkeys up to his cloud forest and this and the other and we Unreal. stopped there for a day and I went out for a walk with him and a few others had come up and the old man stopped on mm. and just took it in and, and he said he had a good 20 minutes of anxiety about the fact that he was probably on his own like yeah. there are no doctors there's nothing like yeah. for, for, for days away Yeah, and I, I never really thought about it um, you don't then. It's until you learn some stuff or you, until you see some, you know, until you see yeah. the outcome of accidents and you see the outcome of things going wrong that you really understand, you know, those those positions mm. that you, you, you're, you're holding you, into. But in thinking about this podcast, like, where you went is another level. Yeah, we knew that was part of it. And it's a, diff- it's a different thing being out there. But we where we were, we, we had a map. <laughs> we had a yeah. Map. And, you know, we had a track to follow and we were happy with, you know, and we, we had, had a Garmin and we, and we had a way to be tracked externally. You could log into a computer and see where we were, give or take. So we always felt we, people knew where we were. Yeah. But it doesn't change the fact of how long it would take to actually get some yeah. assistance. You can't fly a plane there. Um, it'd be helicopters. It would be, it, it's really remote. We worked out, we legitimately would have been the only two people if, if you drew a line in every direction for at least 280, 300 kilometers, every direction, there, like without question, wouldn't have been another person mm. for a lot of that. And that's just factoring in where a couple of cars might be, not assistance and help. You know, it was really, that was a big part of the planning for us and um, that, that was part of preparation. Mm. Do you, you have know? to tell any authorities that you were going Yeah, to? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we covered all our bases. You know, we yeah. let the police in Halls Creek and also another um, kind of used dad as a conduit back home he'd be able to track where we were and yeah. he had a couple of really good contacts so he was a fantastic um, like base if that makes sense and, yeah um, it was cool I got home and he'd kind of tracked where we were and particular things and so there's great little you know overview of it for the for the future but um, yeah but people can know where you are and if, if, but if something goes wrong, it, it's up to you guys to deal with it. Mm. And there's a level where things can go wrong from a time point of view, where particular things aren't allowed to go wrong. And I was very, very Such aware as. of that. Well, you know, you've got a rifle. You know, you you've got to be really careful with with weapons. Um, attacked by a bull camel. You know, broken, serious. You know, coming off a camel. Um, Losing a camel. We almost did that. Yeah, we almost lost four. <laughs> four? Out of five? <laughs> In one go. How's that? It was funny. Yeah, it was funny it now. It was funny now. <laughs> we were walking along a track one day and we did this thing where we'd 
It must have been in the second half of the trip because we wouldn't have allowed ourselves to think like this in the first half. But in the second half, we were walking along, we were talking about what we do when we get home. Oh, that's a recipe right there. Yeah. Come back. And if you've ever seen, you know those cartoons or movies where the guy's in prison and the, like the thought bubble comes up and they're out at a restaurant eating or something like that. Yeah. But what we, we, we were talking and like I, I was saying to Anthony, I was like, he's like, oh, what, you know, what would your perfect morning be getting back? And I was like, oh, this one's easy. I'd just walk out into my car and I'd talk about how I'd open the door and you'd, you'd talk about the steering wheel and what it would feel like and starting right. it up. And, like you'd really, you had time. Yeah. You'd yeah. really like talk through, like it's not just, oh, I'd go down and get a flat white and that'd be it. You know, like you yeah. really like, it was a whole sequence. Yeah. And it's almost. music on. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what it was like. And it was like, it was dreamlike. You, you were almost there. You weren't, mm. but it was very like in detail and it was like that bubble. And we t- were doing that. Oh, probably for about 15, 20 minutes. And then Anthony just goes, holy shit. Like, what? I thought it might have been another bull camel because that, that had happened a bit by now. And it's like the camels have turned around. There's one camel. There's the lead camel. So it's meant to have four, four behind it. I was leading it. So, you know, I, I, I took a bit of responsibility for it. But it, you just can't. When the camels are all in sequence moving together, it's like a ship. Yeah. The whole thing just moves together. And that's how you know things are going smoothly. And when you feel a target, one of the animals is sitting down and there's a lot going on. It's not yeah. this smooth picture of five animals following nicely. But, um, yeah, they, it wasn't there. So I've, st- I've stayed where I was. Anthony's run back down the track and found him 400 metres away. Um, the good thing is they were connected and camels are really smart, but they... You know, they, they're they not going to go... They tried to go in different directions and just tangled. Like, they, they couldn't have gone anywhere without yeah. breaking more lines. And he brought them back and we were laughing. Like, we were laughing at the Bad. time. <laughs> and, you know, that had a lot of... That had a, 80% of our stuff. Yeah. And uh, he brought them back and I said, Mate, what's happened? Like, did we break a line or something? And it's like, no. We, there's a way you feed the connection line through the saddle and we just must have missed it that morning like it was like one mistake and we almost lost four camels so the next morning part of it you know this is a fair bit into the trip where things are you know smooth and we've got things dialed but you know you make mistakes really simply so we'd have there was another element to the checks when we left in the morning like you, you had to almost do a like a circle and then the other person watch and go, yep, 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 yep. All right, cool, sweet. Yeah. Where we go, you know, like hitching up a trailer. And, but yeah, we didn't lose them. Yeah, yeah that was good. But uh, yeah, that was that was the only that was the only time we nearly like, we nearly lost them. Yeah, yeah. Where did you go on the journey? Don't know if I've come back for it. <laughs> <laughs> I had a really good experience. I had a really hard experience. Yeah. It's definitely the toughest thing I've done and I've been really lucky I've done some good stuff. Yeah. And f- def- definitely hard. The f- because most things like this take you to places that you wouldn't normally go. Yeah, you know? they do. And you find resources in you that you never knew you had. Yeah, yeah. But the journey to that can sometimes be dark. It is. Yeah, it is. It's, um, but it's what I wanted, you know, and I, and, and I got it, you know. And, yeah. In what um, way? I think... Well, it's interesting, but like between Anthony and I, there's so much you can talk about because at some point, you there's no point asking, you know what, you know what are you up to, what you've been doing. You know, you know, <laughs> you know what that person has done for every yeah, second of the last twenty. Like it's yeah, we would joke, yeah. you know. Um, so what you you lose, you lose a, and what you understand is you lose a bit of variety in how much you rely on talking to different people, mm. you know. Um, so that, that, that's a tough thing. Um, when, you know, like humor is always a really, really good thing and, uh, you, you got to use it and you, you have to have it, um, mm. internally, if anything, you know, when things are going wrong, like just try and see a funny side, even if it's like a darkly funny side, <laughs> darkly like funny. find it, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you miss certain things, but that was expected. But I was really, yeah. oh, I wanted to see what, you know, what that was and what, you know, really where your mind goes. And that was a big part of it, you know, really interested in just, you know, psychology and what the mind does. And we thought 
early early in the trip, the planning the trip, there's I guess a bit of a romantic idea of, you know, what would it be like to go somewhere remote where there's no advertising? You know, you're not bombarded by the world's news. You're really on your own. And where does your mind go and where does it settle? That was a big thing for me. It's about as pure an environment as you're going to find. You won't, yeah, you're on space. Like, you're removed from everyone. And besides the odd vehicle that you might see, maybe Mm. every four days, five days. Not even. And so there's a real... But you also have a task to do, and there was almost so, there was also so much physical work to do. But there was a lot of there was a lot of quiet time, like a lot of quiet time, mm. walking. It was very meditative initially in the day when the temperature when the temperature was good for that one hour in the morning before eight o'clock, before it skyrockets. Um, it's really pleasant, and you could have a really fantastic experience. And then it just became pretty grueling after that. But um, Oh, your question, where, where did it go? It, just, it goes oh, everywhere and nowhere, you know. And I think if I think about it now, looking back, probably, I mean, there, there's a rote nature of the task. Okay, just do the next thing, just do the next thing. Okay, that's outcome driven. Mm. But you've got to find your motivation and you've got to... You, you really have to have one and if you don't like it's a pretty lonely place mm. you know what and was yours it's funny I, I, as I said that I didn't actually I haven't actually thought about it. I've thought about a lot of things since yeah. coming back and a lot of things out there well, and, did, did, yeah and because this question is coming up you know often with these things the true nature of why you did it only becomes apparent afterwards yeah yeah and, and I'm curious to know what was happening during now yeah, before we get to that. Question. Yeah, sure. So we, during it, where where the mind's gone is besides just do the next task, um, probably probably a whole lot of internal self talk that's pretty positive, to mm. be honest, and not in a not in a wanky way, not in a yeah. you need to think like this and this is how you get through. Nothing like that. Really like a. Like a, like if you don't have that, then you don't have anything. And I think I'm lucky. I, I think I've got that. And maybe because you had to, mm. you know, maybe because you had to. And uh, understanding your own character le- from events that are happening out there and challenges that are happening out there, um, really looking at, you know, the way you act, the way you interact, how you respond. Um, can you maintain your character when things aren't going well? Yes. Really interesting things under a lot of pressure, a mm. lot of a lot of stress, and a lot, lot of fatigue. Triggers you off. Can. Yeah. Can trigger you. Doesn't yeah. mean it has to. Yeah. Yeah. You almost like feel the start of it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But you you decide how you act, and mm. you decide who you want to be. Yep. Yep. And I'm, and I'm. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. Yeah. With what I found. How did you and Anthony go? <laughs> Tough. Yeah, yeah, and not because because not- I, I read I, I I can't remember who it was, but I watched an interview with a pair of guys that went to the North Pole. Yeah, and they spent three days where they just didn't fucking talk to each other. Yeah, and what and what and one was leaving like ten minutes earlier than the other. Oh like, wow, I can't be asked to talk yeah. to them for three days, and then it got to the point where they had to have a chat. Like, oh yeah, we, we can't we can't go on like this. No, no, no. There's no room doesn't work to leave things unspoken in those. And um, yeah, oh, I say it was tough with Anthony, not because it was Anthony, just anyone yeah. in that situation. Um, I think we did remarkably well, you know. And what we are good at and what we did very well in the training beforehand is um, when a problem came up, it was spoken about. So have an uncomfortable discussion, move on. Yeah, but really, really move on and just get on with it. Yes, line. Yeah, yeah. So you know, honesty is really important. Um, well, there's no place for bullshit. Out in the middle well, of the you just don't have the energy for it. Yeah, that's the thing. You're talking about conservation of resources because you've you, like <laughs> yeah. you just you've got so much to do that you don't you don't have the luxury of hanging on hanging on to stuff. So, oh yeah, we we had some difficult moments for sure, but. Um, 
no, like we still finished it together. We we did it together. Yeah, we never went for these periods of days, you know, anything like that where we're not nothing like that. Yeah. Um, no, just um, you know, and he had a family back home, so you know, kids, and so really aware of other stuff that stresses that he's got going on. Yeah. And it's it was a like, and so much credit to him that he's the only other person that understands how difficult this thing was. Yeah. You know. Unless you were there, really, un- like we talk about lived experience, and um, unless you were there, you just yeah. like you you just cannot com- you can't comprehend yeah. you know what it, what it's like. Yeah. So um, yeah, difficulties that we expected that um, nothing we didn't overcome, and nothing that we didn't you know find solutions to and 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 work through to to. To get through what, yeah. and to, to end up where we wanted to to end up, yeah. But uh, yeah, you've got to be careful who you you do these trips with and stuff like this. And it can be a um, I can see how it can be a recipe for disaster if you you, you get the wrong person. So yeah. you want to know, and even if you know a person really well, you're going to see you're going to see either parts of them amplified, yeah, or you're going to see the stuff that's normally on the tails that you doesn't normally come yeah. out you know um so yeah you, you you gotta factor all that stuff in and, and the same with yourself absolutely you know yeah. and you know you can, i think you can be quite caught um what's the word i think you, you can be caught off guard if you don't know yourself pretty well mm. um at mm. some of these things that come up you know uh yeah those environments will do it for sure to go and find those spots. For sure. Yep. Tell me about the finish. In my mind, I'm actually, the word that's coming up is underwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's not exactly a finish line with people. No, going, yeah, no it's, it's not. And we had an initial uh, <laughs> plan to end up on the coast, um, which was going to take a lot longer. And with the challenges in water that that had to change mm. early in the trip so there was a lot of um a lot of change that was happening and the duration we were out there i'm still really happy with the amount of time we spent out there that was in line with what we went out to achieve and um and crossing um you know the great sandy down you know you know north to south but the um the the finish line finish line was a camel pen it, it, it was a town, yeah. An Aboriginal community, community called Coonawarriji, or Well Thirty Three on the Canning Stock Route, but Coonawarriji. Yeah, I think there's sixty people, um, locals that live there. And we walked into town. There was this pen, this camel. Oh, I say camel pen now. We didn't know that's what it was at the time, but it was a pen um, that had been built in the eighties by a local, this guy called Morris four camels using some old BHP steel and yeah. it was quite a bit serendipitous because we, this guy came out a legend local guy yeah and we were having a joke with him and he said yeah I built these I said yeah, yeah I built these so like, yeah in the 80s and I'm like oh yeah and I was like what what you build them for we thought oh maybe some livestock or something he's like for camels and I'm like okay no problem like, how many camels have been in here and he's like these are the first with 40 <laughs> 40 years later, we're rolling into town with our five camels and this yeah. where we didn't really plan on finishing, but what became, you know, like the most important place on the map for us. And there's these camel yards there that this guy built in the 80s that are getting camels in. It was, it was, it felt good. It was a funny, it was a funny way to, it was a nice little, I don't know, element that was sitting there the whole time for us to, in this journey and it was really yeah. cool it was really cool but yeah we got there and we kind of looked at each other and what we would count the days in how many days not how many days were left but how many sad saddlings we had left that yeah. i'll be happy not to saddle a camel for the rest of my life yes like we that's how we counted our days because it was so so yeah so horrendous as a repetitive task every day that you had you had to do you'd love to just leave leave them on We've learned a lot since and how we could have done things differently, but you know, you, you do these things punk rock, you just get out yeah. there and um and, and do it. But what was really good, we uh we, we were getting picked up and the old uh dad came, Anthony's dad came, 
Um, seeing them was uh, our mate Billy, who was involved, came. So these three vehicles turn up, and it was like not the cavalry, but it was like, all right, we're you know this is happening. We're getting out of here and getting in a car after walking at four kilometres an hour in the desert. <laughs> yeah. Just, just it's a different like comprehension speed. of speed. <laughs> yeah, it was. it was. It was really, yeah, it was an air conditioning. But, um, yeah. No, but, yeah, no, a good ending. Good ending. And what was it like integrating back afterwards? Yeah, interesting. I think it's still integrating. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're all good now. The, it took us a while to come back. Um, fixing trailers and broken and broken stuff, but got back and um, yeah, really, I physically pretty shattered, you know. Really took a bit of a toll, um, but came came good, you know. Over the next couple of months, uh, nothing major. Just you know, just I think the end of actually a, a big project. You know, yes. I looked. It was really for fifteen. 16 months is really what you were wrapping up not just the yeah. actual trip itself you know and you weren't fresh going into the into the desert we weren't you know well slept and ready and fresh we were like we were getting stuff done for those weeks like yeah. you, you were knackered before you, you started yeah and um but yeah good like there's a still have a nice level of simplicity and i still i still now year on have moments where you know, be having a really normal day and just being really content with some pretty pretty basic simplicities that we've got day to day. And if anything, it, it met my expectations of um, almost resetting um, what you do value, what is important and how, how much we have when you can be under the impression that you don't have too much. You know, it's life's pretty easy. And the yeah. one thing I did think about a lot, and especially coming back, was how many of our own problems we we cause. You know, and yeah, we, ours is a different you know journey. Things were basic. It was like we just want shelter, we want water, and we want food. You mm. know, and you didn't have the luxury of worrying about other stuff. And you know, it's pretty hard to. It's not hard because everything's relative. This is the world we live in. And what people concern themselves with, I think, sometimes can be, you know, pretty unnecessary, pretty overdrawn. Um, Unproductive. Definitely unproductive, but it's almost like things are so comfortable in your life and with what we've built that... It's human nature to look for problems. And I think people are looking for problems in the wrong areas. Mm. And we're so lucky with what we've got. There is, if you finding ways to build up problems that really aren't there, then it might be time to go to your own walk or go do, you know, there might be a challenge somewhere else that can require some energy because it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty bloody lucky. Mm. Mm. So as you look back on it now, as I said earlier on, what do you think was the true purpose of the trip for you? For me, I, what I think it is, is, and what I've taken away and, and thinking about things post-trip, uh, the nature of people, you know, more than the nature we were in. Okay, so by that, looking at how everyone involved I was saying before how they came out of the woodwork, but just a genuine interest. But really the way people treat each other and the way that people extend themselves and it's really clear the intentions of a particular person. You know, mm. so I, I don't I don't want that to sound too atmospheric or, or whatever, mm. but what I mean is you Throughout that process, you knew very quickly the character of people, and it it blew me away. The we had a couple of times we had a couple of vehicles go past, and they'd stop, and they were so interested in what we were doing because the message had got on yeah. you know track saying the Camel Boys, and so everyone wanted yeah. to talk, and we didn't really want to stop. We needed to keep going, but yeah. the uh, the good nature of people 
Like we had people leaving gifts out for us on the track, like wow. a day ahead, and just stuff where people really like they really cared about you and they really cared about what you were doing. And um, the yes, it was a really good experiment in seeing the inherent nature of all the people that you interacted for better or for worse. Yeah, that's what it was. And I've got a really clear picture of what I like in people and. It, the real elements I value in what I give to people and and those kind of behaviours mm. that, that I extend to people. Oh, yeah. And I suppose it's amplified when you're in that exposed position. But, yeah, and when you're on the receiving end of it. Yeah. And thinking th- they would have thought nothing. Because you've got of, nothing to give at that point. Everything I've got, that oh, you need is on that camel. Oh, nothing more, nothing yeah, less. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and these, and w- the other side to that, the flip side to that is, even if you don't think you're doing much for someone, you really are. And we'd have people get out of a car and, you know, they'd, they'd offer you a beer or whatever, or, you know, they'd leave a note at the well a day ahead. And for them, they're like, it was like maybe a tin of sardines or something so simple, but just the act of it. And, um, you know, I, and coming back, like we had a bloke from, I think he was from Kojina. He was a legend. He was out there on his own on a motorbike. And he camped with us one night because we were, there were two days on that trip. We were at the well, so we had to stop for a day. And we said, come and, like, we'd feed them. We'd say, come and, we were just so stoked to have someone else to talk to. Yeah. <laughs> really? I had enough of it. Yeah, yeah, I know all your stories, Anthony. It's all good. I know what you did. Yeah. Um, so we'd say, come and camp with us. And, you know, we feed. this happened twice, actually. And um, you're in the middle of the desert, so you're crossing your fingers. They're not serial killers. And they were probably doing, <laughs> they were probably doing the same. Yeah. But... They, yeah, I got back and we, we raised some money and you, you look on the screen and the guys chipped in money. Like the amount of people that found a way to find us and help us was, yeah. and you know, it was difficult. I didn't get to say thank you to everyone. I said thank you to as many as I could and we had a wrap up event and whatever, yeah. because for me it was really about everyone else that, that helped um, on top of what I, you know, what I got out of it. But um yeah, there were some people that came out of the woodworks, and if you if you ever un- unsure of the the nature of people and people's intentions, like ninety nine percent are pretty pretty bloody good, hmm. and um, yeah, never underestimate a small gesture hmm. gesture if you can do it. That's so interesting because we spend a lot of our time being default mode. Hmm. All right, what's this dude about? Yeah. What, and, what are they up to? What's their angle? Yeah. This, that, the other, da, 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 da. Yet. It, it was funny. You're so right. And you get a group jump out of a car. They're a different generation. You know, they're a bit bogan or whatever. That's all good. Um, and people in this environment, you'd never speak to. Not out of not wanting to. Just You just wouldn't. Just don't like, you just, you like, interact. You, you, your brain's going, where do we level off? You know, how would we? And it's just not there. And you meet these people and they're hugging you five minutes later before they get in, in your car. You know, as far as breaking down some boundaries, um, you know, that, that was happening. And it was really, it was really inspiring, to be honest. Yeah. And I, the, the, less, the lesson I took from that is, you know, and, you know, it's an easy one and we can all say, you know, don't judge a book by its cover and all this stuff. But, you know, given a chance, people are pretty bloody good, you know, mm. and if they're not, it's probably in the environment that they're in, you know. Um, so, yeah, we, we got really lucky. I had a lot of experiences like that, mm. actually. And that was the theme that kept coming up for me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What do you value? How do you want to be treated? How do you treat other people, especially when you're under stress? Yes. Mm-hmm. What um, have you found yourself almost wanting to get that message out more to people since seeing it? And it, oh. I'm not saying as in you know, yeah, like books and do shit. Yeah, but yeah. as in, do you? Yeah, you, know, you go and do something like that. You know, big serious thing. You yep. have these learnings you drill into what's important in life and sure. what's not, not taking things for granted and sure. stuff like that. And then, yeah, inevitably, two, three, four, five, six months later, you're back and people are moaning about shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, you're like, in the desert, that would really not mean. No, that's right. Anything. That's right. And et cetera. Um, and you can see it for yourself. Do you, 
did you find yourself getting frustrated with other people or you just no uh, I, I know what you mean and do you see where I'm going I, I one you know like the yeah. first time first time I went traveling by myself like my little brain was expanded I came yeah. here to Australia right yep. and my brain was expanded I met new people I'd done it by myself wag a wag a wag come back and I'm all like you guys need to do this you yeah, need to yeah, yeah, yeah you need yeah, to do yeah, that yeah. you know yeah it's a difficult one it's it's a really hard one because there's what, what I have learned in my, my my time on this planet so far is things are things are earned you know you mm. you don't I get to mm. think like that because I've earned it yes and while You've I can talk to you it. I can talk to you about it and you can you can understand it but it it, it, it won't it, it's not going to sink in. It's not going to be part of you until you find a way to earn it on your own. Yeah. So I think what's more beneficial? One, I know how I can deal with people. Mm. I can I can be that person. Um, but two, is what maybe what can that person do so they can learn that in their own way? Yeah. You know, or what's not everybody what's has to grab some to them. camels and Yeah. No, nah, and I also like the idea that we are different. You yeah. Know, I think that's actually that's yeah. that's that's a really good thing, and. Um, you know, it's going to be pretty boring if we all come away with the same things that I'm really, you know, that I, 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 yeah. re- I, I learn or that I, that I gravitate towards, you know, because on the next trip, it might be something different. But um, yeah, there, there's definitely scenarios where it's, you want to be able to explain to someone that um, I guess, you know, that's, it's, it's not wisdom, but you know, it's like someone who's actually lived through something and mm. they see someone who's doing exactly what you did before, before you they, opened your eyes a little bit. Yeah. So um, just do, yeah, do what you can to help. and But let, let people come to their own conclusions as well. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, for sure it's difficult. Um, and it, and it, it's hard. Like, I think what, you know, the way I think about it is what, what makes that, you know, that idea in my head sp- special or what you know why is that important to you know that's important to me but um yeah i don't know it's difficult it is difficult but i think it's earned i think and the value is in actually earning it and coming to those things on your own because there's so much and look we were briefly talking about it before yeah the podcast um but there is so much knowledge out there Mm -hmm. knowledge is nothing unless it's applied and, yes. and it's applying it or finding an environment where you're going to find it, apply it, yep. learn how it works. And then you'll have the lived experience. Yep. And then you'll have a sense of knowing. And there's a difference between knowledge and knowing. They're two different things. Yes. They're two different things. And, um, you know, and, until... That's value. That, that, that's the, the, only, the only way to get something out of something is to to do it to to do it that it seeps into you and you know you can immerse yourself in all this other stuff or you can learn about all of you know this topic here and that's one like and knowledge is great knowledge yeah. is really good but do something with it and um if you're unsure what it is that you want to do with it just do it for yourself and if something really hits home with you then all right, there's something in there that clicks. That's a little shift in the direction that you probably, you know, might, where your life's at, where it might want to go. You know, there's a reason you can respond to that. Mm. Um, but yeah, just having having knowledge, having ideas, it's great. Put them into action. Find a way. Find find a way in your life to 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 sift through those and see what clicks. Because there there will be a reason why those particular things click, and at different times in your life as well. Yes. So. There's a timing element to everything. And, um, you know, some of the lessons I've learned from this trip, you know, didn't make a lot of sense until, you know, maybe more recently. So there's, yeah, yeah, get find a way to take it and do something, do something with it. Hmm. So what are the sort of, themes in the clock cog whirring at the moment for the you next can hear them. yeah <laughs> and i tell you what me probably spend me asking you questions and getting you talk about it for an hour it's probably gonna get oh, going again yeah they will yeah i don't know so for me like the desert was so barren 
Yeah. And so the ant- so where I kind of put it all, I've had a little bit of time to think about it. I think the Antarctica kicked it off. You know, that that was pristine. That was like another yeah. planet. That was, I really had a couple of moments there where, you know, I was like, yeah, this is it. You can go and earn all the money in the world, but you need to go and do experiences. That's where value is. You're going to be, yes. you're going to be 90, 80, 90. That's going to happen. Mm. And um, the point for me is uh, a big part of it is you really want to look back and look at what you've done and to know that all those things were available to you and the only thing stopping you from doing them was a decision. You know, yes. you choose to do what you do. So yes, If you don't like what you're doing, that's out of a choice. And I, I get people have different circumstances and people, everyone has tragedy and everyone has problems. But... Underneath all that, there, there's things that you get to decide every day that you either opt into or opt out of. And that's 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 where you really start steering the ship. So the Antarctic was one of those real, not a wake up, but where I really felt, I felt good. And mm. I felt like, yep, yeah, this is me. And if I can combine something physical in a, in a wilderness or an experience like this, then, you know, let's, I need to do it again. So I went to the desert, and then that wasn't beautiful in the same way as mm. the Antarctic, but it, there was another lesson in that. And I think I'm glad that was the order because I got lured in with the Antarctic, but if I had yes. done the desert first, that might have been it. Yeah. Um, so, But as far as what, what I want to do next, it's, it's definitely something. I think it involves... Um, it'll be physical, but it'll be in an environment that's beautiful. I, I, I don't need to go back to another desert. Yeah. For a while, I, I really want to immerse myself in. Um, I don't know what it is. I'm, uh, it, it, I'm moving towards it. It's really started kicking in in the last month. There's a real need, um, so I'm I'm going to find it. But yeah, it's going to be it's going to have an element to it, a, a bit rejuvenating maybe after the the desert. But yeah, definitely be physical and it'll definitely be in nature. But anywhere on the planet is fine. So opens up a few doors it does yeah it does um where are the camels now calamundi camel farm yeah they came. yeah them. yeah so part, they were never ours to own yeah. so the deal we have with chris is we'll train them then you can have them back and you have can you seen them. them since yeah yeah i have they're healthy <laughs> chris has put one of them into his yeah. you go out there and do treks and so you can do day rides and they've ended up out there so yeah they're living they're living a mm. pretty Bloody happy existence out there. And uh, I don't know if they want to see me again. <laughs> <laughs> enough for me. Yeah, that's the one. Did this give you a greater sense of purpose in your own life? I know you're clearer on that. A gr- I don't know if it's given me a greater sense of purpose or if it's just fitting into what I think my purpose should be. Mm. So, which is, which is to have a crack to to find things that are difficult, and put it this way: I've since my early twenties, I've like I've really, uh, I don't know what it is about death. I've thought about it a lot. There's something about it that is just like I've I just really get it, yeah. and. Apparently, a lot of people get this in their fifties, yeah. where they and I've, I've seen that quite early. Like, not it's not a fascination. Yeah, it's a real awareness, and yes. I really get, you know, this timeline. Yes, don't know where I've got it from. Doesn't matter, but it just sits there, and I'm I'm okay with it. Yeah, it's fine. It's not a fear of death. No, it's just no, 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 not at all. It's it's a it it's about being near the end and not having done justice to to your life so for me uh in a in a in a long-winded way it's just when those opportunities come up that feel right and they seem to be there for you like for you not just you know for everyone and like but you'll know when it's for you uh go and do it like there's a there's a reason you really connecting with an idea and I think we're lucky like it will let us 
when that happens, there's there's a window where it kind of calls out, if that makes sense, but then it'll go away. It's not going to call forever. So yes. there's a time where um, you need to pay attention. If something's bugging you about something, there's a, there's a reason. So a call time. it intuition or gut, whatever. It doesn't matter what you call it. But if it's something that your mind keeps coming back to, there, there's a reason. So if, if you took, I don't know if purpose is the right word, but... Um, to, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it is to give give your life purpose. Yeah, mm. so definitely. But there's something tied in with that timeline, and and when you really grip the finality that you know life is temporary, and every day you're making a series of choices that you know you're going to exist in the future. You know, and um, what you do today is going to affect you know the you of tomorrow, a week, a month. You yeah, know, talking about health or whatever. Um, but I, I just, I can visualize, it's like scarred in my brain. I know that if I make a decision doing this, it's almost like I can see the track of where that's going to take. And I like to jump on those tracks that go somewhere good or somewhere interesting at mm. least. And even if things are a bit average or a bit weird or a bit tough, that's I just want to experience a whole spectrum of, of experience. So yeah. I'd much rather just get involved and find out than just sit around comfortably. You know, I think we really work well when we're put under stress. We're, we're designed to be under stress. Um, and we're also designed to have a hell of a lot of capability yes. if we choose to. So, um, yeah, if from a, in, a, in a purpose sense for me, that's that's really more what it's about. Getting, yeah, maybe getting to the end and looking back, pretty happy with what you've had a crack at. For better or worse. <laughs> mm. It's interesting, actually, because um, relationship with death is, is something. I've asked a few mm. I've asked a few guests about it. Yep. Um, the first one, I think, was a guy called Mike House, who's, who's one of these guys who, for like his 50th birthday, just got helicoptered into the middle of the desert and Amazing. spent a couple of days walking out Good on by him. himself. And... Um, you know, I was asking him, but yeah, it's, it's, it's probably another bigger topic I might explore with the podcast, which mm. is because I can't help thinking that your relationship with death, it's like, you know, what's your relationship with money? Cause that affects how you deal with it. You sure. never think about your relationship with money, but it's real. It's, but it, it's, it's real. And you know, it could have been shaped by your mom or your dad. Is it mm. scarcity? Is it abundant? Mm. Is it mm. something you need to hold on to? Is so mm. you can always find? Sure. Yeah. You know, and there are other little topics like this. And I think death is a key one. You know, a lot of people are shit scared of death because yeah. it's a complete unknown. I mean, it's the ultimate unknown. And we don't talk about it. We don't. In our culture. And we're not exposed to it. Yeah. You know, in a, in a Western culture. So it's not, yeah, it's, it's kind of kept away somewhere neat yeah. and tidy. And that, but it happens. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Like death and right. taxes. And so. It's a guarantee. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, um. I can't help thinking that if we had a more open and honest conversation yeah. about it and you actually were able to reveal to yourself, what is my current relationship with mm. death and is it a healthy and productive yeah. one? And then how does that affect how I live a lot of my life? Because it's one of those that's probably programs that's sitting right at the bottom. Yeah, 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 mm. yeah, yeah. We're not really, I think wide to think about it all the time and I think that's a good thing you know I don't yeah, you know you but, but my car, but no 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 you don't and but it's I think there's a really big gift in um I'll keep it simple to thinking about it um not all the time every now and then mm. and um accepting it and reverse engineer it I look at okay okay all right sure we're every person you know that that's where we all end up mm. um so what are you doing what are you doing about it? You know, what are you, what are you, what are you doing today? What are you, what are you, who are you trying to be? What do you want to achieve in your life? Where, if, even if you don't know what it is, that's okay too. But use that as a springboard to start moving towards these areas that, you know, even if it's a really faint call, like start listening, it'll, it'll reveal itself. You yeah. Know? And, you know, it, what I'm into is definitely what, not what someone else has to be, you know, it might be being a good mother or a good, you know, mm. that, you know, there's some one, like the most amazing things you can do are some of these things that we think are, you know, just part of life and normal. But I think when there's a little part that you get to take for yourself, 
um, yeah, explore it. You know, like it just, yeah, you know, you consciously choose to live a, live a good life. Yeah. Mm. What do you do to keep yourself sort of grounded on an everyday level? <laughs> I don't know. It's not, yeah. Oh no, that's not true. Do you have any I, routines and stuff. Yeah, I do. I do. I, I I try to get in the ocean every morning, and I yeah. know that sounds really simple, but like I got you know got down to Port Beach this morning, and you know it's a lot cooler at the moment, but mm-hmm. that, that's great. And I think and it, some of these things aren't easy for me. It's easier not to do, but it's not really about getting down there. It's about doing something when you don't really think you need to do it. Yeah. Um, I'll use that time, I'll get in the water, I'll look out and I'll kind of think about my day and I'll think, okay, all right, well, what do I want to, not what do I want to achieve, but like, who do I want to be and how do I want to, you know, so there's a real, there's something in that, you know, where, okay, we start again today and that whole concept of one day, one life, you know, like yeah. how you act today it is in, in, in broader sense what your whole life is like. So yeah. really giving attention to, to, what, to what you're doing. Um, so I love that. Without becoming the most ultra cliche person in the world, um, meditate. So 10 minutes, I just call it sitting down and breathing. I do yeah, ten, yeah. 10 minutes a day. and I've, Sit down with your eyes closed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still. Your hips hate you initially and then yeah. all of a sudden, you know, they, they get better months down the track. And, I, you know, I joke about meditation because it's very popular, but it, it, it works. Yep. Um, I don't know how it works. I don't know how it's working, but I know something's different. And I think, if anything, it's just a really nice pause in, like, it's like taking a breath in your breathing. Mm. Uh, sorry, in your thinking. Yeah. Um, so I've really put a lot of effort into that continuously for the last, you know, 12 months. You know, that's been, I've stuck to that and yeah. having a good streak with that at the moment. And, but yeah, so I enjoy that. Um, but really, it's, prioritizing your health and your fitness yep i really understand i'm in this body for life like this is it yes look after it like it's great to have a good bank balance it's really good yes you should have one but like your body is exactly the same as having a good bank balance yeah. and so and it's you the know, first balance actually, no it, yeah, yeah it is and i i think you know if i can look after this t- and look you know people get sick and you know mm. and i i i get it and but for the parts I can be responsible for, I will be responsible for, you know. And you know, I'm not, I'm not religious about it to the point where, you know, I don't enjoy beer and you know, you've got to mm. enjoy your life. But ninety ten, ninety percent get the get the stuff right. That's that's your one vessel that you that no if buts about it, you're carrying through. So the stuff you want to do later, this is gonna open up time to be able to do that as well. So that that's a priority. Um and it's it's everything it's getting balanced across everything right but that i've found historically and there's not hasn't been many times where i've let that one go for um mm. but that is that's got to be full full operational level for everything else to happen and it's not a physical it's not an appearance thing yeah that's a that's a byproduct it's it's allowing you to you think so much clearer you've got energy mm. um it's yeah, it's just where you need to value it. Like it has so much, it has so much value. If you could go back and give Steve one piece of advice before he embarked on it, on the journey, with, bef- not the journey, just before the training or anything, like probably minutes after the, or when you chilled out after the beers. Yeah. If you go back now and give that Steve a piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, they like. Oh. Well, I would have given him a big hint about the saddles he took and how <laughs> <laughs> should have changed them. But um, no, it's a good question. That, yeah. it's a, that's a really good question. Um, oh, I feel like I need to think about it, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to just going to see what I feel. But I think um, you know what? the whole point of this thing was that I didn't know what was going to happen. And giving myself advice, I think, takes away from me earning it. So I'm not. I'm going to stand there and give him a little high five. But I'm just going to say, gonna, so I just want to whisper in his ear and say, "Mate, you got no idea." <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm not. <laughs> I'm like, whatever you think it's going to be, it's not. It's not. But what you're going to get out of it is going to be more. 
So yeah, I you know I'm I'm leaving it. Excellent. And then the final question I ask guests is if you could take a little nugget of information and upload it into the collective consciousness so everybody wow. just gets it, yeah. what would it be? Just don't have fear or don't let a fear or an uncertainty of how you're going to do something stop you in your tracks from doing it. So what I mean by that is I keep always saying have a crack. You know, it's, it's mm. easy but and it, and it sounds quite simple but it, there's a lot in it because it means you're actually you're doing it. Theodore Roosevelt's quote, the man in the arena, uh, just that's it. Like it's the person in there having a crack. It's not everyone else watching. It's not, mm. a, it's easy to be a critic. It's oh. really easy to be a critic. And whether someone succeeds or not, what I love seeing in people and what I encourage people to do is start and don't worry what the end destination is. The whole point of turning up, having go, and doing it is the point. Yes. You know, if you don't worry about the outcome, the outcome will work itself out. Good, better, worse. Yep. The worst outcome you can have is not doing something and not knowing. That's it. So yeah, have, that lead you? Get in, get into it. Awesome. Find out. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Yeah, thanks, Bryn. You it's too. been really, really uh, life affirming and uh enlightening and yeah shit ton of other adjectives that are just not <laughs> coming to mind right now but it's um yeah yeah it's been really great excellent yeah i've enjoyed I've it super valued it yeah thanks yeah a lot of fun i wish and everyone if, could um, see your red vest yeah <laughs> oh they do they will on the picture um if anybody wants to reach out and, and, and talk to you further about this where can they find you i don't a big thing, I don't do a lot of yeah, but, but um, I've got an Instagram account. I think I've got a, a, a group of a family that follow me. I, I <laughs> yeah. just say it's not my go, I don't, yeah. Really, but you know, if there's anyone that wants, there, there's that. Um, yeah. I think it's just my name, I think it's Steve Choate. There'll be a picture of a camel on there, they'll find it, yeah, yeah, or Facebook, that's fine, yeah, um, yeah, more than happy. I, I really I love talking about people, not for not for me. I'm happy to talk about anything I've done if, if there's something they can get out of it. Yeah. Um, but that's the best thing about community and I think that's what we need more of, which is people really helping each other and like how much better off would we be with all the people doing all their own individual, you know, accomplishments, not the right word, but, you know, we want people to do different things. Yeah, yeah. it's the same thread, but let's um, let's find a way that we can, we can help each other. But, um, yeah, there's otherwise, worst case scenario, again, touch with Bryn, with yourself, Bryn, and then put them on to me. But cool. um, yeah, no, that's that. That's easy. There we go, Steve. Thank you very much. Legend. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. <laughs>